in a changing world. Tonight we have Amanda. You want to give a little wave? Great. We also have Brandy on board. Brandy's actually off location right now, so she is streaming from our home. Thank you very much, Brandy, for coming on board tonight. And we have Mindy. And we also have Sarah from Walworth County. Thank you all for being here. Before we start our conversation, we are actually going to have Mindy ground us tonight and start from a calming place. So, Mindy, it is all yours. Thank you, Senta, and welcome everyone joining us online and here. Welcome, welcome. Uh, my name is Mindy, and we're just going to take a minute to just get a little centered. So, I'm going to invite you to take the biggest breath you've probably taken all day in through your nose. Really feel it build up in your chest. Hold it for a sec and then release through your mouth. We really tend to forget about breathing sometimes. So I'm going to teach you an amazing technique to really bring you back to center. It's a great stress reliever and it's called a five, five, seven breath. And so what we're going to do is breathe in through the nose for a count of five. We're going to hold at the top for five, and then we're going to breathe out through your mouth for a count of seven. So again, in through the nose for five, hold for five, out through the mouth for seven. This is going to really calm down your central nervous system for you. It's a, an amazing centering technique. So let's begin. One, two, three, four, five, holding five, four, three, two, one, out through the mouth, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. I'm gonna invite you to try that one more time so you can really feel what it's like to have this tool in your pocket. In through the nose for a count of one, two, three, four, five, holding, five, four, three, two, one, out, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. That is a tool that you can use anytime I'm gonna invite you to just take one more moment with me and really center yourself and set an intention for your time with us here today. I know I always set an intention before anything like this about maybe just being present, learning something new, being open to hear. So whatever it is, just take a moment, set an intention for how you wanna to receive tonight and welcome. Thank you very much, Mindy, for that. It helps us as we start this conversation, talking about how to manage our stress, how to live stress-free. And to start off, Amanda, it is all yours. Well, good evening, everybody, and thanks for coming. My name is Amanda Kosman. I work for the University of Wisconsin Madison Division of Extension. And I'm predominantly a financial educator here in Walworth County. But I also do work in a lot of our coping skills. And one of my favorite programs is the We Cope program, which I'm going to talk about and take some information from tonight. All of these principles go across a variety of different parts of our lives, including our finances. So when you're thinking about something that's stressful, that's a lot of stress for people is the finances. It's a lot of stress for people. There's a lot of you know interpersonal things. But I work a lot with finances and interpersonal issues going with that too. So I'm going to talk a little bit and share some principles of the We Cope. I, of course, work for the university, so I'm going to bring in a lot of research because we are research and evidence-based. The We Cope program is all research-based, and we're actually collecting evidence to make it evidence-based right now. It's a new program, and it's been in just about a year, so I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about the We Cope program. The skills that we learn in that program are to increase positive emotions, even in the context of negative or even stress. Um, we're not trying to erase those negative stressful areas in our lives, but we're really aiming to consciously make room for positive areas in our life. Um, the point of the program really is to work to build stress management skills. And honestly, everybody here tonight is going to talk about all these things. Um, so we want it to become a part, a natural part of our life. And so a big part of that program is practice. And I'm sure Mindy and Sarah are going to tell you practicing these skills they don't come naturally sometimes. So we really do need to practice and be conscientious of practicing these skills. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the research around some of the topics that we talk about. So um, research shows that focusing on positive emotions help people cope with negative experiences and stress. It protects them against the negative health effects of chronic stress. They are usually perceived to be more positive. They have better problem solving skills and they tend to be viewed as more successful. They tend to perform higher than other people that are not practicing um, some of these skills and they have higher evaluations at work to prove it. Um, they usually are perceived as better teammates. They have lower burnout. They're more, usually more engaged and they usually have an increased sense of empathy for people. And it also increases their relationship and satisfaction and quality of life with their romantic partners, families, friends, all those kind of people that they're in. So a few of the ones that we really talk and hit about, I'm sure everybody's going to bring up a whole bunch of them, is emotional awareness. Research tells us that people who um, describe their emotions with greater precision tend to be less overwhelmed. And when they experience intense distress, they're less likely to use those maladaptive coping strategies like binge eating, drinking, aggression, or self-injury and tend to experience less severe anxiety and depressive disorders. We like to talk about gratitude and scientific studies on gra gratitude on students and other people with serious illness have demonstrated that gratitude is related to a number of positive outcomes. Keeping a gratitude journal is associated with less negative emotions, fewer physical symptoms, better sleep quality, and greater sex satisfaction in life in general. Research do believe, researchers do believe that gratitude is beneficial because it strengthens their social ties and increases those feelings of self-worth as well. It also shows that they have less depression and less anxiety, they sleep better, and they're just generally happier people. Another one is noticing and savoring positive events. So according to our research studies, um, being in a good mood can even briefly, can help your body's stress responses settle down when they're stuck in a high gear. And it also interrupts them and it catches them and gets them out of the negative thought process and that circling that people have. And it encourages them to explore and learn new things and make more contacts with other people. All these benefits can really stick around even long after an event that has, been, that has occurred. And those positive feelings actually can be brought up by just bringing up those memories is what the research tells us. We'll talk about mindfulness and mindful meditation. Mindy took us through that breathing so that mindful meditation is really important. And research suggests that people who exhibit more mindfulness in everyday life also experience more positive emotions and less negative emotions. In addition, the results say that of several studies suggest that practicing mindfulness through meditation may be, will help them relate better to their peers have better mental and physical health. So it can be really, really important for people to do that. Um, we also talk about um, positive reappraisal. So research from Harvest Business School. Um, Allison Wood Brooks found that individuals can uh, reappraise anxiety with excitement. And it's a, it can use minimal strategies to help with self-talk and simple messages like a mantra, which can lead them to feeling more excited about something that might be stressful and adapt an opportunity mindset so they can kind of overcome things and use them in a different way. It also will improve their subsequent performance. And other researchers found that positive reappraisal um, helps people to think of stress and minimize any performance implications of the, that stress and increase their heart functioning, their alertness, and their performance. Um, we talk about self-compassion. Um, so this self-compassion can help you have better coping skills. They experience less stress, anxiety, depression, lower levels of cortisone. Um, they have fewer negative emotions on whole, and they bounce back from negative encounters quicker and more effectively than other people. People who practice self-compassion are more motivated, and they tend to make more, take more initiative to improve themselves in their lives as well. Um, so this can have a ripple effect in a lot of things. Um, so the compassion approach is to um, not allow people to let you let them down um, because you're already more compassionate with yourself. So you don't let yourself down or others because they don't see you as stressed about that. And it actually helps you to bounce back from anything that might be demoralizing in life um, that might happen. Uh, we talk about random acts of kindness. When you do good for others, you do good for yourself. Um, you don't even have to worry about people, whether they're going to thank you for it. Just your act of doing it intrinsically can help improve your mood and it helps you with your better health physically and mentally. And it also relate, um, 
uh, related to a longer life. Um, there was a study that was done with folks that had HIV and that stress that comes with that. And because they were focusing on other people and giving back, they actually were staying more positive than other groups. They had a better response to medication and they also had a longer life and they lived a happier, more. they said that they lived a longer, more happy life. Some other um, acts of kindness research will tell you that it's more physically and psychologically for several um, beneficial. Um, it gives you a break from thinking about your own problems and shifts that focus onto somebody else for a short while. Um, it can help you feel good about helping somebody, even those small ways. It gives you a sense of self-worth and it increases your positive emotions like pride and happiness. And it also helps you get through a difficult time. Um, even though you're going through, despite your current stress, it gives you a feeling of satisfaction and it can make you feel better. We also talk about personal strengths. And so our research tells us that they are more aware and they use those strengths more effectively, um, leading to less stress and a greater um, self-esteem, vitality, and positive affect and attaining reasonable goals. So setting reasonable goals that are well-planned and focused on motivating can help motivate us. It improves at least um, those small attainable goals rather than huge, big goals can promote those positive emotions because you can savor those little things. It keeps you motivated because you have a lot of little successes and it helps give you a reason to continuously celebrate not just that end point, but all the little milestones that are in there. So there's what some of the research tells us about keeping our, helping to keep our stress levels down for our overall health. Next up, I would like to introduce Brandy so she can go ahead. She is online. Actually, I think we lost Brandy. So, um, technology, you gotta love it. So let's improvise here. And Mindy, do you want to start sharing with us about your expertise for us, please? Yes, thank you so much. So we'll, uh, fingers crossed, Brandy pops back in because we yes. definitely want to hear what she has to say. Thank you so much, Amanda. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. My name is Mindy Huebner. I am a mindset mastery coach. I work one-on-one -on -one with mostly female entrepreneurs, although I do have a couple of male clients. Uh, so I can definitely talk to both sides about really revealing and releasing limiting beliefs. Limiting beliefs cause stress. <laughs> We did that great breathing exercise in the beginning so that you could have just one little tool about how to really downshift out of stress. And I want you to think about when you're feeling stress, I want you to know what your brain can tend to be doing. It's deleting, distorting, and generalizing based on what you believe. So here's how it works. And this is how powerful you are. You think a thought over and over again, like habitually, you think a thought like, I'm stressed out. And then it becomes a belief. It is literally in your identity. So I want you to think about the words that you say after I am. And if I am stressed out is something that you're saying continually, it's okay. Get curious. There's no, no shame, no guilt. This is just us really getting curious about how we're operating right now so that we can make a shift into operating in a less stressed out, way for ourselves. So we think a thought habitually, we say it, it becomes part of our identity, I am. We then, this is how amazing you are, create a habit to prove it to yourself over and over again. And so if you're continually saying I'm stressed or I am overwhelmed, this is a big one that I find in overwhelm and stress really like they can be cousins or sisters, right? This is, when we say this habitually, we tend to then have these habits that prove it to us because we're always winning the game that we're playing. So what are some more empowering beliefs that you have about how you cope, about what's happening around you, about how you're feeling inside, that you can recognize that these are some I am statements that you use and the habits that you've created for those. So Manny talked about, Amanda talked about practice with us and i just had a client last night she said oh, i'm kind of tired of practicing i said well then get it down right quit practicing just start doing it just start doing it all the time this is the another part about your brain as it goes on autumn it wants to do automated things so for most of us feeling stressed out can also be a habit 
it just kicks in. You think something more than I'm stressed. Like you think, oh no, there's not enough time. Because what are all the under, you know, we call it stress overarching, but what are all the things that happen, right? That really make us feel stressed. So we think, oh, I don't have enough time. I don't have enough time. And we start operating in that. It's something that we're very practiced in. So everyone is practiced at something you just get to start shifting this to a habit that's more empowering for you. So if you find yourself saying, I don't have enough time, here's what happens. You're saying this, you're believing it. And your body's like, oh, this is where she or he freaks out. This is where we run around the house and start yelling at everyone. This is where we do something very disempowering. Again, no judgment, no guilt, no shame. We just get to get really curious. Like, wow, I have this kind of power. You do. Like, you're this magical that you can start shifting this. And again, I'm going to ask you to think about where are the places where your I am statement is super supportive for you? Where are you empowering yourself in what you're thinking and what you're believing and then in your habits? Senta, yes. So as you are sharing that and you're in it, I don't know about anybody else, but I can only speak for myself. It is hard for me to stop take a deep breath and go, all right, I'm going to think of empowering thoughts. How can we train our body to do that? Excellent question. Practice. <laughs> so here, and he, here's what really happens, right? We recognize it after. And we maybe feel guilty or shameful or bad about some of the stressful things that come out some of the ways that we're operating, the strategies that we go to because they are habitual. And so we get to first check in after, like, wow, that didn't go like I wanted. <laughs> okay, where did I start to notice? Here's where I, I want you to think about it like this. Like most of us, there are exceptions to this rule. Most of us don't go zero to 60. We're not like, boom, I'm flipped out, right? We're not like, boom, I'm so stressed out, I'm laying on the ground. Think about when you're hungry. Your body's telling you like, oh, I could probably go down to the kitchen. Oh, maybe I should start making dinner. Oh, we don't usually go, boom, I need a Snickers, right? It doesn't usually mm -hmm. happen that quickly. We ignore it. Mm -hmm. So this is what we're doing with that when stress takes over and we start to embody stressfulness. So we just start recognizing it. So here's what you can do. First, you notice after like, wow, I didn't love that. I can in the future. And here's another thing I'm going to really ask you to get curious about. Instead of saying I should have done it this way in the future, I'm going to try this on next time. I'm going to do it this way. So give yourself that self-compassion, just like Amanda talked about next time in the future from now on and just get rid of should and even could like like those yeah you know like you get to shift your words on that that's all we're already going to start to shift how you're feeling and who you're being so we recognize it and then we say okay when did i start noticing like where was it i started noticing uh, you know when i was at if we're talking about a scale of one to ten started noticing when I was about at a four and I just kind of stuffed it down or I was like, oh, it's going to be fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Or I ignored it. So you get to really start just checking in and that is practice and it's beautiful. And sometimes it's a little scary, like, cause now we're really monitoring our emotions. Like you said, we're really having this emotional awareness and this is a gift for you. Your emotions are beautiful. They make you human and you get to be in charge of them most of the time. Another question for you. <laughs> I'm going to be full of questions, Mindy, <laughs> all of you folks. So when you were sharing about gauging like one, four, five, six, is that how you are personally or is that how you gauge it as a whole with most people? So if my five, maybe somebody else's eight, how do I know, okay, I'm at my five now. I don't even want to see what 10 is like. How do I bring it down? So it's your personal. Like I'm saying scale of one to 10, zero to 60. 
just like really just checking in. You can think about it on a clock in quarters, like however you're like, oh yeah. So I want you to go back to thinking about when you're hungry and really knowing the difference between that first little like growl and the like, someone better get out of the way or I'm going to, you know, like I need to eat something right this very second. Like, you know, your body is telling you over and over and over again, we're just really good, especially women. I don't know what that's all about at ignoring it. Right. But like just really good at ignoring it. So start tuning in a little more. Ask yourself, like notice, look at your watch at three o'clock and say to yourself, how have I been feeling the last 15 minutes? What have I been thinking about the last 15 minutes? How am I feeling right now? Just start to do self check-ins. You're worth it. You deserve it. Really see, just like stop and attend to what's going on. And it is practice, but I, I love everything that Amanda shared with us because I just get to like just go right on top of it because she didn't call it this, but this is what I call it, casting the vote. So she was talking about how those people are more successful and they're more this and they're more that when they have those little micro goals that they reach. So when you decide, okay, I'm shifting my thought process from uh, like claiming the identity of being stressed out or being overwhelmed, I want to come up with maybe a more neutral thing first because your brain's really smart. And if you're like, oh no, like I'm a, I'm a time management guru, your brain's like, no, you're not. <laughs> like, <laughs> come on now. So we get to go to a more neutral place and say, I'm becoming more aware of the clock. I am claiming more time for myself. I am, so find a neutral statement that in your body you're like, yeah, I buy that. Yeah, that's me. I can do that. So find that place now. Every time you show up in that statement, for that statement, you're casting a vote for your future self. You're casting a vote for the vision of not letting stress run you. And so we want to do, well, having goals and tools and all the things that you're going to learn here today are amazing. My hope for you is you want to embody the identity of someone, right, who knows how to handle stress, who negates stress, who reframes. You didn't call it a reframe. I think you called it a re reappraisal. A reappraisal. I had never heard that. I call it a reframe. Who reframes on the fly. This is who you get to become. And so when you're thinking about how to shift this and you want to create habits, empowering habits for yourself about this, you don't just want to read one book. You want to be a reader. You want to become the identity of. So think a thought habitually. What are you saying after I am? You want that identity of, and only you know what it is. Only you know where stress is, is hitting you. What is causing the stress? If you're tuning in, what's causing the stress, right? Getting curious about that. And so how do you want to show up differently? Like, what does it get to look like when you're not consumed by stress, when you're not running around yelling at everybody to hurry up? Whatever it is that happens, the strategies that kick in. Again, there's no shame in that. This is what you know. You do what you know. Now you get to learn something different. Now you can start trying on. And I say trying on because I think try is a little bit of a mm, word. So try and pick up a pen. You either pick it up or you don't. There's no, there's no try. Try it on pick up the pen, try these tools, try these strategies for a week and see how you're different. See what feels good. Because when we want something, when we truly, truly want something, know what you want, take action, be willing to change. So you know what you want. You want to get out of the house on time. Okay. We're just going to go really basic. You take action. You start 10 minutes early and you're still late. Be willing to change. Okay, we need to shift that time. We get to what? We get to what? We get to get everybody ready sooner. We get to <laughs> say the time is earlier. I don't know, <laughs> right? Like what are the different strategies that we can employ to start becoming the humans who? Because this is what you get to do. This is who you get to be. You get to embody the identity of not overwhelmed, not stressed. Because remember, you're always 
winning the game you're playing. So if you're telling yourself, oh, here's one that I love that we, that I have encountered. Oh, I'm a squirrel. I'm a squirrel. I just always, I'm a squirrel. Man, did her habits prove it, right? She was winning the game she was playing. She was okay with that identity too. Like my question is when you are embracing an identity, how is it serving you? So is, if you are the one who always stresses out, like everybody knows, oh, Amanda, she's the one that stresses mm -hmm. out all the time. Like this is your thing. How is that serving you? What could open up if you decided to try on a different strategy? If you decided to start thinking differently about how you get to show up? I like how you worded how you get to show up. I think that is uh, a lifelong model. I also believe that sometimes we are in positions where we don't feel self-confident to show up. How does one overcome that stumbling block? And all of us said, practice. <laughs> and you already are. So he, here's, that's an excellent question. You have already started growing your self-confidence muscle, your self-esteem muscle. I want you to think of a time when you felt confident. I want you to think of a time when you were like, hey, I just showed up for myself and that felt really good. It's okay if it was a long time ago. It's okay if you have to squint to think about it. It's okay if it was like, well, I folded the clothes right out of the dryer. Like that was a big deal because normally I leave them there for three days. Like whatever it is, <laughs> cast the vote. Find it, take it in, and show it to yourself. Like literally keep a fabulous file. This is when I showed up for me. This is when I started building confidence. This is when I, I was building my self-esteem. Here's what you're doing. You're recognizing that past you, showed up for future you or for current you and you know then that you can show up for future you you just keep building on that you keep casting the vote to cast the vision of who do i get to be how do i get to shift this how do i get to change and stress will stop you from showing up in the way you want to show up the last i could talk about this forever the last piece <laughs> is the only thing that you can control is you. That's it. This is fantastic. Because we don't want to control anything else when we really think about it, right? Like we think we could control our animals. Ha, that doesn't happen. Children, please, right? None of those things. We get to control us. So if you were, if you have a tendency to feel out of control, and we're not talking about if you're diagnosed or anything like that. We're just talking about in general. If you have a tendency to feel out of control, you let habits really disempower you, then take back your power. Here's, we can live at cause or we can live at effect. And when we are living at effect, we literally are giving away our power. We're saying circumstances, people, that other driver who cut me off, all of those things stress me out. Like I, and I don't ever show up in the way that I want to show up because I'm allowing everyone else to dictate how I get to be. And sometimes that's a hard lesson to, or a hard thing to hear. It's okay, get curious. Like, where would you like to start showing up? So when we live at cause, we get a list of results about how we're showing up in our life. We might not like them, but we're owning them. And then we get to start shifting. And then we get to start saying, Okay, the only thing that I can control is me. So this situation, this world situation, this work situation, this gas price situation, like whatever situation, I don't love it, but I love me. And I'm going to show up for me in this because that's the only thing I can control anyway. And that will help you to lower your stress <laughs> when you decide, because you've decided if if you're worrying about things that are out of your control, you've decided this and it's okay. Decide to shift, decide to start practicing. So is Brandy back yet? No, no. Dang, that's okay. Okay. Well, what I wanted to say was when you think about meditation, if you're thinking, oh, I can't meditate, I can't get quiet, I can't do this. If you've ever sat and worried and given yourself a stomach ache, you're a master meditator. 
you just meditated on something that wasn't serving you, as opposed to meditating on something that absolutely can serve you. So everyone knows how to meditate. <laughs> and that's a very simplistic form. And start there, start where you're at and start giving yourself some space. You share about meditation. So if you, somebody is completely new at meditating, how do you give them a one-on-one -on -one lesson? 15 second, okay, give yourself permission to do this without, I know for myself, I go, I gotta do laundry. I have to do the dishes. My kids need to be picked up. Dinner needs to be made. Sent to stay focused on meditate. My mind goes and starts circling. What recommendations do you have? Somebody else is going to get to talk to him. I promise I'm going to introduce Sarah. I promise I'm going to introduce Sarah. <laughs> so first, meditation doesn't have to be silent. I love to walk and meditate. I love to be outside and just take it all in. This is an amazing way to de-stress, to clear your brain, to ground yourself. There's literally a Japanese practice like about walking through the woods that completely like lowers cortisol levels, stress levels, all kinds of things. So meditation gets to serve you. Any routine, any habit, gets to empower and serve you. If it's not, then we get to look at it. So if you're trying to do silent meditation and you, you're not loving it and it's actually not working because you're thinking about the laundry and the groceries and all these things, shift, like shift into something else. I love guided meditation because then I don't have to sit in silence. <laughs> I know how to sit in silence. Now I've been meditating for many years. I still love a good guided meditation. It keeps me focused helps me know that I don't have to know everything to do to relax or to breathe or where to focus. The meditation will walk me through it. It'll tell, it'll tell me exactly what I get to do. And I just have to show up. That's it. Like just be present for it. And even then, if my mind is like going somewhere else, cause I hear you, it'll come back. You'll still start reaping the benefits of it just by trying on the practice. So if you want to try silent meditation, I would say to you, try one minute, try 30 seconds and focus on one thing like a word or a feeling or a part of your body that you just want to get into. Like complete silence, like the, everything is rushing through my head like that. Mm -hmm. It takes practice to just like empty it all and not have anything happening in there because you're not made to not have anything happening in there, right? So it, it takes a lot of practice. Is that, is that helpful? Okay, awesome. You're so welcome. You're so welcome. So I, I did want to share one last technique with you and this is alternate nostril breathing and it's, are you going to share it? No. Oh, okay, cool. I'm like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to steal anybody's anything. <laughs> It's crazy because you're like, wah, 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 like your nose starts to run a little bit. But this is an amazing um, technique that I learned from a yoga teacher and people teach it all the time. You can Google this alternate nostril breathing. You're going to make this sign right here. Yep. Everybody hang loose. Okay. So we're, we're going to hang loose. This is how I do it. And you're going to plug one side. So with your thumb, there you go. So you're going to plug this side. You're going to breathe in. And then before you breathe out, you're going to switch, breathe out. Now, before you switch, I want you to breathe back in. And then you're going to switch and breathe out. Now, aside from looking silly and like getting a good laugh, if you're looking at yourself on camera and doing that, <laughs> you're focused on your breathing. You've totally, like, everything else, you're like, what is this woman teaching me right now? Like this, that, my nose is running, she was right. But you, you stopped and you attended to yourself. You just gave yourself a moment. So there are, when we do that, it can calm an overactive uh, mind because all of a sudden now we're focused on this. It helps soften the intensity of everything that's going on. And the longer you practice it, the more, like, your brain, your body will know right away, oh, she's doing this, 
we're going to calm down. Here's a habit that it's kicking in because again, your brain loves meditation. So it will just kick this habit in for you. And you won't even like, you'll just start to do this. And already my chest just went whoop. Like it knew right away that I was going to start focusing on my breath again. The left, if you just want to breathe through the left, like through the left nostril, that's for calm. And through the right nostril is energy. So you can just do one side if you want. I love the alternate. Again, you're keeping your brain slightly busy and you're focused on yourself. And really, it's very difficult for anything else to come in when you're first learning how to do that because you're like, oh, was that right? Did I breathe in? Did I, did I go out yet? Like you, right? So then you're practicing and you're having a good time. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. So I would like to plant some seeds in my children who exhibit some anxious behaviors because mommy's anxious. So, um, but how do we simplify it? I love the breathing thing. I think we could do that. But are there any other little seeds that we could plant to start that process of self-awareness and um, kind of the confidence? I, I definitely, and I'm going to, yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, had a guest who um, has anxious tendencies, children with anxious tendencies, wants to plant those seeds, like breathing, those type, that self-awareness to build that self-confidence. And so what are some ways uh, that she can start doing that, start sharing with her kids? And of course, I'm going to invite everybody to chime in on that as well. Um, something that I didn't talk about, but that I love is tapping. And so that's called EFT. And I'm going to invite you to Google it. And you can actually go to the tapping method. Like it's really any, almost any age can do it. And you're, you're literally moving energy through your body, moving, you're hitting your meridian points, which are the energy centers. And you're just like moving, moving stuck anxiousness in your body. What I would love is, who am I being? Like, who is this right now when I'm, when I'm getting like this? Like, is this, how, how would I like to feel? And how am I feeling? So where am I feeling it? Like, there can be not why, um, what and how. Why tends to then put us into this story of because, well, why, why are you feeling this way? Well, because this happened and that happened. We, we go down a story rabbit trail and it doesn't serve us. So what? What is making me feel this way? What could I do different? How could I feel instead? And when could I have that? So even starting with those really simple questions like that are, is really helpful, I think. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can you Yes. Do you want to mute? Are you? You are muted. Okay, cool. Oh, sorry. No, that's okay. Okay. Yeah. So I was also asked to explain a little bit more about tapping. I am not an expert. I use this for myself. I do teach other people how to do it. And then I send them a whole sheet about tapping. So there are tapping points. Again, meridians. We store energy in our body. If you're familiar with acupuncture or acupressure, they work on meridians as well. So this is a, a nice nod to Eastern medicine. And so here are some tapping points. So the top of our head, right here, and then right here between our eyes, here, here. So this orbital bone, I think this is called, here, 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 right on your collarbone, so you guys can't <laughs> see me, but right here underneath your collarbone, right here, uh, like at the top of maybe where your rib sits, right here, and then my favorite, this is my favorite place to tap, and it's on the karate chop pad of your hand, right here. So here's what, what I teach and what I use for tapping. We start, we start with a setup statement. Even though I'm feeling kind of anxious, I fully and completely love and accept myself. Even though I'm feeling anxious, 
I fully and completely love and accept myself, even though I'm feeling anxious. And the, as we're like honoring how we're feeling and moving this, we start to move it. And then we're like anxious. It's going to be okay. Or there's no script for it. It's really like shifting through. Like the bus is late. <laughs> you know, like what, whatever is, is happening, right? Like money, anything. And I know we're talking about kids, but now for everyone else, like money can be a super stressful, anxiety producing thing. And so like the ending statement of I, I wholly or I fully love and accept myself, like you're still amazing. Like you're still worthy. You're still completely loved. And you get to remind yourself of that no matter what you're feeling, like you still get to accept yourself in that. And, and that's just a gift that you can get to keep giving yourself. So I can, when I tap, I can start right here, and boom, shift the energy immediately. This is my favorite spot. So I'll just take a big deep breath in. I can, like, already my, my heart rate went down. And you can use it to relieve stress and to move stress. You can also tap when you're happy. Like, I am so excited about coming to this event because it's in person and I'm going to be around real life humans, right? Like, this is going to be so great. I'm going to see smiling faces. I'm going to have amazing coffee. Like, seriously, there's a, you, you get to use that as a tool for yourself as well. Then you're also training your brain. Like, we get to use this as a stress reliever. We get to also use it, like, for gratitude and for contentment. And you just start training your body and your brain to just start showing up a little bit differently and to recognize how you get to show up a little bit differently. How about you guys? What are what are some stress or some ways that she can plant seeds? Um, Amanda. Um, I used to work in youth development for UW Extension. So when we had young people that had some anxiety disorders and went to 4-H camp or something, we used a variety of different tools. Um, one of our favorites that worked especially for the specific kids I'm thinking of um, was three things you named, three things that you see, three things that you smell, three things that you can touch, three things that you can feel, you know, just a variety of different things and let them kind of go through that process and think through where they are right now. Um, another thing that we would like to do is Sometimes I can think of a specific other kid um, when he felt stressed, he did the tapping. So mm -hmm. he tended to tap his legs and he, that was actually a sign for us to help him move themselves from the situation. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times it was a reminder because you could just tell that that's what they did was tapping. But when he got really vigorous and be like, Oh, come on, you know, Sebastian, let's get over here. And, um, let him have that opportunity because he already had that coping mechanism. So one of the things that I always talk about is each kid is different. So like Mindy was talking about trying things on, all those tools I rattled off before, they might not work for you. Meditation might not work for you, but being mindful, having a piece of chocolate and being really mindful of how it feels in your mouth. How does it taste? How does it change? If you chew it, what's the difference? And really just making your brain stop and think about that piece of chocolate. It could be something as simple as washing the dishes. So as your kids are doing that, if they don't like washing the dishes, turn it into a mindfulness activity. If they're going to be stressed, they might find, how does the soap feel in your hands? What about the cold water? When it comes out of that hot water, how do your hands feel? And help them think about those little sensations and those things to kind of take when they feel stressed, take that moment of whatever they're doing, even something that they might not enjoy doing, and make it a moment where they can lose the stress. Or just set that aside over here and enjoy. I don't like doing dishes, but I like the way my hands feel. I like the way the, the silkiness of the soap. I like the smell of the orange from this. And give them an opportunity to kind of feel what they're doing and stop and focus on something else. But also give them that opportunity to find what works for them. So don't think there's going to be one silver bullet. We're going to, you know, Mindy has a variety of different things. We all have a variety of different tools. And kind of talk to your kids about it. Um, 
we have a book that I'm going to hand out that if anybody wants it, you can. It's the We Cope little book. But there's a great wheel in here to share with your kids. Uh, one of the first ones you talked about is identifying your thing. So uh, for those of you at home, the motion wheel, it's one of my favorites, is letting them identify where they're feeling. And what are some of those sensations and catching it early. So when your stomach starts to feel bad, what does that connect to? And help them. They can even look at the wheel and point out what are they feeling and how does that work? So catching it early, too, and identifying it before it gets out of hand and letting them catch it early. I think that's what I can think of now. Does anybody else have anything? All right, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, so a lot of similar things to what you guys said. Um, I think the emotion identification, that's where we oftentimes start a lot with kids, is just like starting to create that awareness around the emotions and what they are when you feel them and not um, attaching any guilt to any of those feelings that you feel, that they're all okay, they're all valid, it's okay to feel them, um, and recognizing um, that you're – creating that awareness and then maybe able to communicate it to someone else. So having that open conversation with your kids about like, we can identify feelings together. We can talk about that together. Um, and just being able to have that safe place as a family to maybe like talk together about emotions. Um, I know a lot of times um, with kids will do a lot of like um, affirmations or like appreciations, like especially bringing parents in, um, where they like take time as a family to just like sit down and say like, I really appreciate, you know, that you made my favorite thing for dinner. Um, and then following that up with an affirmation of like, I did, you know, I'm really proud of myself for studying for half an hour last night. Um, and just reminding yourself, um, and modeling it, it yourself for your kids as well. Um, being able to, you know, model those behaviors, especially if you too, maybe feel some of those anxious emotions, um, being able to show them like, yeah, sometimes I get really worried myself, but, um, I can cope with it and you can too, to give them that confidence as well. Yeah. Mindy, thank you very much. Sarah, I'm going to have you chime in and, and share about your expertise. But before I do that, you talk about a stressful moment. Brandy has had a stressful moment with her technology right now. <laughs> Unfortunately, she is not going to be able to come on board and share about her holistic practice practices. Um, but she asked, did send me something and she said, stress tip, stop, breathe, and don't stress about the uncontrollable as she is doing right now, I'm sure. Um, we do our best. That does not mean being the best. Sometimes our best is just waking up. She shared that she's going to try to record something and send it to me. So um, folks that are online, I can send that to you, as well as the people that are here in person in attendance. I do believe if you registered, I have your email, so I'll make sure to send that as well. And even though Brandy is not here, please send us your questions to her. She owns a studio here in Elkhorn called 1111. It is a very, it's downtown, it's newly opened. It's a holistic practice. It's her and her partner that are running it. It's a very good place to center yourself. So on that note, Sarah, please share with us where you're from and some techniques and your insight, please. All right. So I am super excited to be here and be able to talk with everyone. Um, my name is Sarah. Um, I am a therapist over at Walworth County Health and Human Services. I've been there for about two years now. Um, I work a lot um, with a wide variety of people. So um, children, 
um, teens, adults, um, families, and it ranges from issues with like mental health, trauma, addiction, um, you name it. Um, we are a very, you know, um, we serve everyone. Um, so very excited to be here. Um, I know a lot of the stuff I'm going to um, touch on is going to be bouncing off of everybody else and the great points they made today. Um, but a lot of it will be um, just um, some overview about stress, um, ways to cope, and then some of the resources that we have um, at Walworth County Health and Human Services to help hopefully assist with some of your stress. Um, so the first thing um, that I just really wanted to touch on um, that I think we hear a lot about um, when thinking of stress um, is like that fight or flight instinct, um, which is what we often refer back to when learning about stress, the like textbook stuff. Um, so fight or flight is more of that um, sudden or ongoing stress um, that tends to activate your nervous system um, and kind of really floods um, your bloodstream with adrenaline and cortisol and all those hormones that tend to raise our blood, stress, blood pressure and cause us to feel um, that stress. Um, that, that increases your heart rate, um, spikes your blood sugar, all those things um, that make us not really feel good um, when we start to feel stressed. Um, so this put changes on your body um, can um, cause you to not, not feel good, um, but it also can be helpful to us because that fight or flight um, can serve um, to help us dodge a car accident or um, maybe run from a bear if we're in the woods that's attacking us. That's that adrenaline rush that we get to kind of react and respond in the moment. Um, but oftentimes with most modern chronic, chronic stressors, um, we can have more of that fight or flight um, more frequently. And if we have that fight or flight response more frequently um, and more consistently, that can be really bad for our health, um, for our body and our overall um, well-being. Um, so that's things like you mentioned, like finances, like constant finance stress, um, a challenging relationship. Um, it causes your body to be in that heightened state all the time, which isn't good. Um, so stress can be good because it can help motivate us and get us out of maybe some not so good situations. Um, but long term stress um, doesn't doesn't serve a good purpose for us. Um, and I think, too, a lot of like the past two years with like COVID and like everything that's gone on, um, a lot of people have been very stressed of like the unknowns, the anxiety um, you know, burnout in people's um, workforces, um, you know, just ongoing stress, um, constant changes, not being able to see family, more increased isolation. We've had a lot of constant and ongoing stress, I think, you know, the past two years that have been really hard for us and being able to be resilient and bounce back can be hard. Um, that's why I love these events, because it provides us with a lot of resources and information um, to be able to learn how to be resilient and get resources on how we can bounce back and cope with these stressful things. Because unfortunately, life tends to hand us those things, um, but there are ways to bounce back from it. Um, so stress can lead to a lot of not so good things. Um, so like we know, like poor sleep, um, poor eating, um, weight loss or weight gain, headaches, excessive alcohol or drug use, not being able to concentrate, fatigue, irritability, um, a lot of stuff like that. Um, also, going off some more research stuff, um, there's been a lot of studies on how um, stress kind of does make your um, life clock tick faster. Um, so stress is really proven to take um, years off of your life. Um, so prolonged stress, for instance, definitely increases um, risk of heart disease, diabetes, addiction, mood disorders, things like that. Um, and it really weakens our ability to regulate our emotions and think clearly. Um, so even though um, that those are maybe some not so hopeful statements, there is hope that um, learning and developing emotional regulation skills that can help us to, in a way, buy back time and kind of save and add on to our life um, to live a more healthy and fulfilling life. Um, so we talk about emotion regulation, and maybe you've heard it before, and I think we might have mentioned it a little bit tonight, but emotion regulation is basically just um, a fancy way of talking about someone's ability um, to cope and manage and respond to maybe an emotional experience. Um, so emotional regulation can be a lot of 
a lot of different things. So whether it's like guided meditation, whether it's reaching out to a support person, um, it can really vary. And that's, again, finding that thing that really matches or fits with you. Um, a, a lot of it for some people is maybe um, balancing work and home, like re, really reevaluating your schedule and where you're putting your time, um, building in regular exercise, um, making sure you're aware of what you're putting into your diet and what you're eating. Um, a lot of people um, maybe like caffeine, like coffee, um, which I am a big coffee person and I probably drink too much coffee, but also knowing that coffee can really increase anxiety at the same time as well. Um, so if you're wondering, gosh, why am I so anxious all the time? Caffeine is definitely um, something that energy drinks um, can really um, heighten your state of anxiety. So being mindful of the things that we're putting in our body as well that can cause some of those uncomfortable emotions, um, limiting alcohol use, um, connecting with supportive people is always good, um, carving out time for things like hobbies, things that you enjoy. Um, it can sometimes be hard to do that. Um, when we have our busy lives, we sometimes forget about our own stuff, the things that we enjoy, our own self-care, and actually carving out that time and being aware and mindful um, about, you know, taking our time for ourselves. Um, sleeping enough is always important. And then, um, of course, if it's something that you are comfortable with um, and are open to, seeing a therapist is always an option as well. Um, so kind of touching base on some of the stuff that we have at the county, um, it can really vary on your needs, um, but we offer a variety of different things. Um, we always have individual therapy. Um, so if you're wanting to connect one-on-one um, -on -one with someone to kind of talk or process through um, anything that's maybe more stressful going on in your life or just wanting to increase um, or build upon ways for you to cope with stress, um, that's definitely um, always a thing that is heavily talked about in therapy of how to maybe deal or cope with or stress, um, cope with stressful situations better. Um, we also have various groups at Walworth County. Um, so that can be from um, addiction groups to um, mindful awareness groups, um, a lot of different things, um, skill building groups. Um, so we have a really wide variety, a lot of amazing people there um, to help really fit your needs and what you're wanting if you feel like you need that extra added support. Um, we also have a crisis line as well. Um, so that is a resource um, that's constantly 24-7. Um, um, if you ever feel like you need um, to call or just talk with someone um, to, you know, get some things off your chest, let them know how you're feeling if you're having a really hard time and in a really stressful situation. Otherwise, there's always um, the national crisis and hope lines as well that you can call. Um, but a lot of good resources um, at Walworth County, if you're ever just interested, you can always call. That's always an option too, if you're just wanting to get more information as well. Thanks, Sarah. I, I'm gonna ask a question for all three of you. And mostly, Sarah, it's going off of something that you, the emotional knowledge of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Is there a technique that we can do a, a check in our bodies? And I, I believe, I think I heard Amanda talk about it earlier today. And I don't think we were online yet, but the body scan, can the, mm -hmm. so you folks share a little bit about that? A body scan can be a really, really good tool to use because it really helps us to check in and take a moment. I like, like Minnie said, those facilitated body scans because it helps keep me focused on that and it keeps it kind of, so I don't have to think about the process. I can just think about my body. So once you get good at it and you practice a lot, you could probably do it on your own. Minnie's probably good at doing it on her own when she wants and she's in the mood. Um, I need a guided one because I will sit there and think, okay, and I got to start at my feet and I'm too, I get too wrapped up in the process of what I'm doing and don't really pay attention to my body. So I would encourage people to find a body scan that they like that's recorded. Even if you record it yourself, if you found one that's written and you record it to yourself, that works great too. Um, but the body scan just gives you an opportunity to start. And I always like to start at my toes, just my thought process. I don't know. Start at the toes and move up. And then I start my fingers and then move in. So 
how you want to come to that is up to you, but it also is what works best for you. So find that body scan. Sometimes you have to visualize a location that you want to be in and then do your scan. Sometimes you can just start doing the scan of your body, but really come to the mindset that you're really checking in on yourself and pay attention to where you're feeling those aches and pains. Where does that anxiety show up? Where does our stress settle in our bodies? And once you start noticing that, you'll notice it at other times. So like I said, practice. Mindy said practice. Um, you'll also notice that, oh, my elbows kind of hurt. I, I hold a lot of my stress in my forearms because I start clenching. And as soon as you start noticing that little ache, you'll be like, oh, I'm starting to feel this in my arms. And that's where I tend to first notice where it shows up. Hmm. And so soon that body scan doesn't just come with awareness of your body, but it will actually tell you when you're starting to get stressed. So it goes both ways. So I really would advocate for a practice that is moderated by somebody else or yourself if you're reading to yourself and give it that opportunity until you get good at it. And then it'll start going back and forth and just recognizing that, hey, this is really working. My practice is really paying off because I just noticed I was getting stressed before I even got to a three because my arms were already starting to tell me before I even got there. Because um, your body will tell you way sooner than your mind will. So I really do love body scans. I brought it up because I actually have one in my bag. Um, so when I teach, I pull that's my favorite one. I pull that one out and I read it um, because I love it so much. Um, so it's one of those that are walking through the forest and you kind of feel where your feet are. It's a nice, very visual one. Um, and I try to pull in little elements for everybody. So try different ones too. So if one's not working for you, try a different one. Maybe you just like a female or a male voice. It could be whether they have waves in the background or birds. Try a variety of them and see which one settles you enough that you can really focus on different body parts and how they're feeling in that moment. So you can find a base. So do this when you're in a good mood, when you're in a neutral mood, and when you're in a bad mood. So you can find out what's the difference in my body because you'll notice that too. So really getting to know yourself in good times, bad times, neutral times, and taking that time to really just notice where are you feeling it? Where does it settle? Where is that chronic stress that you might not have that fight, flight, or freeze kind of feeling? But that chronic stress that's when all week you get this and that and appointments and the kids are not being haved and it's, it's nice outside so they want to go outside but they're stuck in class. And so where does it settle when it's two or three days old? What's your body telling you? So that's really my advice. Somebody shared in the audience that they have children and um, when they were younger, they did the body scan and it was very successful, even focusing on an item like a butterfly over their heads and touching it or pretend to touch it with their fingers and start from the top and work down. Um, and that, that was a great way because another question that I was going to ask was actually about a child is young children, they don't understand emotions. You were talking about the emotion wheel and, and shared about that. How do you try to calm a child down when they don't understand their emotions or don't understand that wheel to know where they're at and the possibility of them feeling better about themselves or get into a better mood for any of you expertise folks? I do want to reiterate what I believe Sarah said, and that is not invalidating mm -hmm. any emotion. Mm -hmm. You're not wrong or bad or naughty or any. Uh, they, I know that it is difficult as a parent sometimes to not just go into the habit 
of how you were raised or whatever it is, I, I completely understand that I have grown children and I have godsons that are little. And so I'm doing it all over again in this beautiful, slightly different way because I'm wiser, I'm older, I'm wiser, right? And they're not my children. <laughs> and so I get to practice in a different way, not invalidating their emotion. None of this, I'll give you something to cry about, like all of those things that can really tend to, in an older crowd, be very like, this is it. This is how we deal with these things. Just really recognizing that. And when I say invalidate too, you get to use this with adults as well. Um, just because you don't understand, I don't understand how you're feeling, doesn't mean I need to invalidate it. Well, all you need to do is this, just tie your shoe, just pick up this, right? Wow, that must be frustrating. I can hear that it sounds like you're sad. Just start honoring whatever is going on with them so that they can start tuning in to it. Because most kids, if they're verbal, will be like, I'm not sad, I'm mad. They'll start telling you then when you're recognizing. And I, I they happened to speak to a client today who has a four-year-old who was having one of those very upset crying times when they can't even speak. And when he finally calmed down, she was like, oh, are you, what's, what's frustrating you? Are you upset about this? Are you upset about that? He's like, I'm upset at my body. So they'll tell you, you know, like, and then you get to walk through it. Another thing that is, is I love the validation thing is saying, I see that, or I hear that you're feeling frustrated. You got some big feelings going on here. Do you want me to just sit next to you? Or do you want to be alone mm -hmm. with those feelings? Do you want to talk about them when you when you feel ready and invite them to have that discussion? Sometimes they don't want to talk about those feelings afterwards and they just pass and then they want to move on to happier things. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. You know, don't bring it up as before you were really mad, what things you want to do? No, you know, if you are curious and be like, you know what, before you had some really big emotions, do you want to talk about them? And then give them that invitation. And if they say no, that's okay because they might have already regulated that, calm themselves down, mm -hmm. either realize that they don't need to discuss it anymore or they're not comfortable yet, but at least somebody validated that you have these big feelings. And, you know, how do you want to handle those big feelings and giving them the option to do it and inviting them and making sure it's open. And if you think that they want to discuss it later, opening that door to them, but being okay and letting it, not being committed to an outcome. Mm -hmm. Let the outcome be theirs. And if they do something that's wrong is so like Mindy said before is instead of saying, well, you should do this and you should do that. How do you think you can handle that in, in the future? Mm -hmm. And letting them make that choice is what do you think, you know, what do you think would be a different route? And even if they don't want to try on a different route, they can at least brainstorm some different options if they do want to talk about it. So you're giving them that option to do that. And with the body scan, I love the idea of a butterfly. I never thought of that one. We usually give them something tactile, so a ball. Um, I talked about chocolate before, but actually when I do this with kids, the body scan, I usually give them an orange so they can smell it and they can do it because we try to be healthy. Um, <laughs> so we always work with an orange. Chocolate's more fun for me because, you know, we can do chocolate. that. It's chocolate. <laughs> um, but we always work with the orange. But sometimes we'd say, you know, like, something that you feel. So if we had a basketball there, how does it feel? And give them that opportunity with the body scan. Is that, they're not scanning their own body, but it helps them to focus on something tactile of its own. So if you really need to start from like, you know, the 500 level, like you're not even at the, you know, you're, you're really starting below what you would think for an adult, like, you know, the 101 level, you're gonna be at the 50 level. Um, handing them something, an orange, smell it, how do you feel? And so then they kind of get used to analyzing something from a body scan or analyzing something in a systematic way. First, that's not them. And then help moving them into that. So it could be as easy as when you're going to be at home and you're going to have normalizing at lunch. Oh, look at, we got oranges today. Don't they smell good? You don't have to tell them to the smell. Like, oh, it smells so good. And then they're going to start doing it. So just let, helping them to recognize externally some of the things that they can feel touch smell but also then it's going to be easier for them to transition to how does your stomach you know like when you get really angry how do you feel about that where does it 
when I'm anxious, it gets in my stomach. But we're not all the same. Where do you feel it? And letting them have that conversation. They might be a little bit older, but just starting little with those little things like an orange, an apple, and help them to take a moment to be mindful of it because mindfulness will move into that body scan and the meditation. And, you know, it just helps them to make it natural and practice um, before they know that they're practicing and modeling that for them. You know, smelling your food, mentioning what you smell because it makes more sense for them to mention what they smell. But if you mention, I'm feeling very upset right now. I'm feeling a lot of anxiety in my stomach. I wonder why, you know, and naming it yourself, they all naturally move into that. Um, I know for a lot of the work we do with like little, littler kids, um, for a lot of that awareness around emotions or starting to like implement some of these skills, um, when we talk about feelings, we'll only do like a couple, like angry, um, scared, happy, excited, tired. Like we'll keep it very minimal, like list it out maybe coordinate it with a color, like I'm feeling red or yellow. So keeping it very simple for them. Um, and then a lot of times I know we'll have kids that um, they can't even verbalize it yet. Like they don't even, can't even get it out there, especially when they're feeling upset. We've done, um, and you can find them on Google, um, like the little emoji faces, and then it'll have an emotion underneath, just printing that out. And then they just go and point. So just starting to create some awareness around like the nonverbal. So like, what does the face look like when it's happy, when it's sad and being able to identify like right now, like I'm feeling this, like this is, this is where I'm at. Um, and I know that's been helpful with a lot of parents because they're like, my kid won't even tell me what they're feeling. Um, and I don't know how to gauge or how to understand if they won't even verbalize it to me. Um, so a lot of times we'll start with the charts just to kind of get it out there. And then they eventually get to the point where they're like, yeah, I'm feeling mad right now, or I'm feeling scared, or I'm actually just really tired. So that's where we start a lot of times for like the littler, littler ones. Thank you. I do have a question that popped up is, can too many hobbies stress you out? So if you try to keep yourself busy and keep doing something and you find joy in it, but you find yourself that you're doing it too much, that it's hurting you, what techniques can you first recognize, how to recognize that, and then stop from doing that so you can find your joy in the hobbies that you are doing? So it sounds like someone's already recognized it <laughs> and is continuing to do it. This is, we get to get curious about this. What are, so our brain operates in gains and losses as most adults, kids too, even though they can't necessarily verbalize that. So you get to ask yourself, get curious about what are the gains? You can also think of it as pros and cons, but what are the gains that you're having, receiving, by continuing to operate this way and what are the losses and you can just be real pragmatic that way and look at it um what is this is going a little deeper what is the belief that i need to keep busy i need to like what is this belief how is it serving you because this could be a limiting belief that is actually protecting you when you're keeping yourself super busy from maybe just being present, from maybe dealing with some emotions, from maybe like being present in your life instead of just keeping yourself busy. So sometimes beliefs are protecting us, but they're really a reverse protection. They're mm -hmm. keeping us from being successful in what we really want because they're stopping us from tuning in. They're stopping us from slowing down. They're stopping us from being present. So really, what are the gains from operating this way? What would open up for me if I spent less time doing this? Like, what, what would I get? What would be the gains then? And what would be the losses of shifting out of this? Because lots of times we'll go, oh, there's really no loss. I'm not losing anything by 
showing up differently in this way. And we just get to verbalize it at, either in, you know, in your mind or writing it down or however you best process, you know, maybe just, I have full on conversations with myself. So <laughs> if someone's home, they're like, oh, you having a staff meeting? <laughs> like, yes, I am. <laughs> uh, so like, exactly, whatever, however you process best, process and see what are the gains, what are the losses? Would anybody else like to add? Oh, I would say the fact that you're asking that question might be more telling than what we can say you with the answer, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to give a shout out for Mindy, is a coach can be really helpful. I do financial coaching, but Mindy does, you know, more positive life coaching. So a coach, if you are really exploring some of these questions for yourself and want to dive deeper into what is that belief or the habit of keeping busy to the point where you're thinking it's almost detrimental um, and maladaptive, mm -hmm. how is that affecting you? And, you know, you could go to someone like Sarah and a psychologist and talk about that or go to a coach if you want, if you're more comfortable. But going and actually exploring that, and it could be meditation or thinking about it or journaling. Um, there's a variety of different ways, talking to a trusted friend. So there's a variety of ways that you can do that, but really exploring without being attached to the answer. So try to just not be as attached to, I love basket weaving. I basket weave. Um, I love it. And I started teaching classes. I decided I wasn't teaching classes anymore because it took the joy out of it for me. And so... I liked the extra money I got when I taught classes, but I really had to explore, like all of a sudden I wouldn't do it on weekends and I wouldn't do it this time. And I had to really become unattached to the teaching portion and really unattached to basket weaving in general for me to really think objectively of why am I doing it this way? Why do I not enjoy it anymore? Why is it this? And you kind of have to almost detach yourself and kind of look at it objectively from a different end, lens. So I like to think of, you know, stepping outside yourself. And if I was a friend, what would I tell myself? Mm -hmm. What questions would I ask? And really determine what things do you want? How can you be using the time? Like Mindy talked about, um, what can I gain by not doing this? What do I gain from doing it? And just think about it and come up with what works best for you. I really like how unattached. I like that terminology because I find myself attached to my answers <laughs> and when I talk to myself and have those meetings with the best person. <laughs> um, so thank you. Is there any other questions? No? All right. Well, thank you, ladies, very much. We have Amanda from UW Extension, Mindy, who is a life coach, and Sarah from Walworth County. Um, I appreciate your attendance tonight, your interaction regarding this In Conversation event. Our next event will be held on April 20th. It's actually Safe on Social, and it will be held at the Alcorn Area High School in the auditorium. That event will not be live. We are going to try to record it, but it's an in-person event. It will have somebody from the DA's office, the undersheriff, human services, and a lot of other nonprofit organizations to help teach us about social media and how to protect our children and ourselves in some aspects. So we hope to see you there. Thank you again for attending tonight. Stay resilient, stay healthy, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Have a good night.